welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 81, The Great Treason Incident. Picture the setting, a small room in Nagano Prefecture in 1910, home to one Miyashita Takichi, a lumber mill employee. The date is May 20th, and outside, the police are lining up to prepare to raid the place. They break in and begin to search, only to find exactly what they feared would be there, parts to produce a bomb. This confirms their worst fears. It's exactly as they suspected. Someone is plotting to kill the Meiji Emperor. The raid on Miyashita's home was the climax of an investigation which came at one of the most unsettled points in Japan's national history. Only five years earlier, crowds had rejoiced in the streets at victory over Russia, but that rejoicing had been short-lived. The military had done an excellent job at keeping a lid on just how hard things had been going in Manchuria, and as a result, the majority of Japanese were simply not aware of how much they had sacrificed for victory. In particular, they had no good explanation for the fact that their country's debt was not being wiped out with a massive war indemnity. The Japanese had in fact decided their position was not good enough to demand one from Russia. For the fact that their country was not annexing everything up to the Amur River in northern Manchuria, same reason. And for the fact that rice prices were spiking inexplicably. Military requisitioning was driving up the prices, but most people assumed it was just war profiteering. The results were riots that started in the Hibiya district of Tokyo, but spread across Japan's big urban centers, and in which eventually over one million people participated. For the Meiji leadership, this was something out of their worst nightmares. They were dangerously close, it seemed, to losing control of the masses. You see, perhaps because some of their first experiences abroad really coincided with the high watermarks of the European left, the Paris Commune, for example, or the steady rise of the German Socialist Party, or the early days of the British Labour Party, the leaders of Meiji Japan were always very worried about the threat of leftist ideologies like Marxism, Anarchism, or Socialism. They worried that Japanese industrialization would naturally bring these same problems to Japanese shores. In part, that fear actually spurred these leaders to be more progressive than they otherwise would have been. Borrowing from the playbook of Otto von Bismarck, who did the exact same thing in Imperial Germany, the Meiji leadership, led by Ito Hirobumi, Yamagata Aritomo, and the fiscal expert of the bunch, Matsukata Masayoshi, decided to implement several reforms to preempt a lot of the issues socialists traditionally drew support from. In particular, they arranged for the passage of factory acts regulating working conditions and hours in the 1880s, at which point Japan had less than 50 factories across the entire country. The idea basically being, we'll need these laws eventually, so we might as well have them now. This kind of system is referred to as a social monarchy. In essence, the monarchy provides reforms normally associated with socialist parties in a sort of paternalistic way designed to attach the people more directly to their ruler, who cares, clearly, so deeply for their well-being. Despite their best attempts to keep a lid on things, however, the radical left began to gain strength in the early 20th century, and that scared the hell out of the Meiji leadership. It's kind of hard for those of us born at the tail end of the Cold War to really grasp, because we tend to think of ideologies like anarchism or socialism as that thing your slightly stoned friend from college won't shut up about. But at the time, these were really potent ideologies that scared a lot of establishment people, because of their potential for forcing radical change. This was particularly true of anarchism, which as an ideology had motivated a wave of assassinations in Europe and America during the latter half of the 19th century. Tsar Alexander II in Russia in 1881, President of the Republic of France, Marie-Francois Sardi Carnot in 1894, Empress Elizabeth of Austria-Hungary in 1898, Incidentally, her corset was laced so tight that after she was stabbed, she didn't start to bleed seriously until it was taken off. And President William McKinley of the United States in 1901. And those are just the highest profile ones. There were plenty more. Thus, the Meiji oligarchs decided to complement the old velvet glove with a little bit of the old iron fist. In 
If playing nice didn't work, well, how about a little good old repression? The first targets of their wrath were organizations like the Japan Socialist Party, which was first formed in 1901 and then shut down by the police within, and I am not kidding, three hours of its formation. Also in the crosshairs was an organization called the Heimincha, the Commoners Association, which produced a newspaper called the Heimin Shimbun, the Commoners Newspaper. Its editor, a young intellectual named Kotoku Shusui, had produced in that paper, among other things, the first partial Japanese language translation of the Communist Manifesto, as well as the works of Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin. The Heimin Shimbun was also shut down in 1905. Koltoku, by the way, is both a fascinating person and central to the story, so we should talk about him for a little bit. He was the descendant of a rather well-to-do samurai family, because no, the stereotype about rich kids embracing Marxism or anarchism is not a new thing. From what would have been Tosa Domain and what was now Kochi Prefecture in Shikoku in 1871. In his 20s, he fell under the influence of Katayama Sen, a prominent Christian socialist. Kotoku II embraced socialism and was one of the founding members, with Katayama, of the aforementioned Socialist Party. Like everyone else, he was arrested within a few hours of its formation. However, technically speaking, there wasn't anything they could be charged with, so while the party was shut down, they were released. Katayama and Kotoku, however, ended up splitting. Katayama moved away from Christian socialism, which was a big thing in the 19th century but not so much in the 20th, towards communism. He would eventually join the Communist Internationale, help found the Japan Communist Party in 1922, and spend the remainder of his life in exile in the Soviet Union. Kotoku, meanwhile, began moving towards anarchism. He left Japan in 1905 for the United States, where, in the age-old tradition of hippies everywhere, again, not making this up, he moved to San Francisco and joined a commune, because some things never change. His rationale for leaving was a desire to openly critique the emperor and the imperial family, whom he saw as the legitimizing force of the evils of Japanese capitalism. He returned to Japan a year later, after incidentally living through and helping rebuild from the great San Francisco earthquake in 1906, a very different man from the one who had left for the U.S., now he was a committed anarchist, and among other things, he abandoned some of the more moderate goals of socialism, including universal voting rights, in favor of a more radical position of direct action against oppressive structures of government. Direct action, of course, makes the authorities think of the fates of all those world leaders who had been killed by anarchists, because what's more direct than a bomb throwing or a stabbing? In fact, Reading his writings, it's more likely Kotoku was calling for general strikes than assassination. Now, it's worth stopping here to note, because if I don't, any anarchist who listens to the show will likely flood my email with messages reminding me that most anarchists then and now did not advocate violence. Just as with a great many ideologies over the course of human history, it was only a small lunatic fringe that did but of course, as a general rule, the lunatic fringe out there is always better at getting noticed than the down-to-earth people. Anyway, between his previous past as a socialist and his current one as an anarchist, Kotoku was now definitely a person of interest for the government. They were watching him very carefully. This despite the fact that after his return, most of his public energy seems to have been expended on that great pastime of the left-leaning, internal structures between functionally identical factions. In particular, the Japanese left was split between anarchist, Christian socialist, and Marxist socialist camps, with a smattering of other folks thrown in to keep things exciting. It's all very Byzantine and vaguely reminiscent of the whole People's Front of Judea versus the Judean People's Front bit from Monty Python's Life of Brian. However, the fact that Koltoku and his allies descended into squabbling that would be incomprehensible to most people didn't seem to change the picture as much for the authorities. He and his friends were dangerous. This impression was confirmed in 1908 by what was known as the Akahata Jikin, or the Red Banner Incident. On June 22nd of that year, a prominent anarchist named Yamaguchi Koken was released from jail after serving out his term. He was greeted by a giant anarchist rally, 
several hundred anarchists waving banners with slogans like revolution and anarchy and communism greeted Yamaguchi and the police, terrified of this human mass, decided that something had to be done. They went in and started beating and arresting whoever they could get their hands on to disperse the rally. In the wake of the incident, the new Prime Minister, Katsura Taro, who had taken over a few weeks earlier from our old buddy, Sionji Kinmochi, future Japanese delegate to Versailles and tutor of Konoe Fumimaro, decided that he would crack down on the troublemakers. He began to push for even more police power to be deployed against socialists and anarchists. And that leads us to where we started. On Katsura's orders, the police began digging, and through their infiltration of anarchist cells, sometimes I really wonder how many of these cells were actually anarchist, and how many were all just police informants snitching on each other, they came across a plot. Someone had talked about killing the emperor, and apparently one of the people they'd spoken to was Koto Kushusui. So the investigation continued, given more urgency by the assassination of Ito Hirabumi, since his assassin, Anjun Goon, was often incorrectly described as an anarchist, a label he's sometimes still given today, though he was not, he was very much a nationalist. The plot the authorities had come across was very real, though only five people were involved in it. One of them, by the way, is someone we've talked about before, Kano Sugako. She was one of Japan's leading feminists, and like Koto Kushusuke, had started out a Christian socialist and moved towards anarchism over time. Kano had also been in a relationship with Koto Kushusui, though by 1910 they'd broken things off. Her life story is absolutely fascinating. She was born in Osaka to a family of merchants in 1881, and became involved in socialism because at the time it was one of the few ideologies out there unquestioningly dedicated to the idea of women's liberation. She became a social critic and a journalist, but over time, more committed to direct action. Unlike in the case of Koltoku, who was definitely not involved in this assassination plot against the Emperor, she definitely was. Someone talked, though, and the police pounced. In addition to grabbing the five people actually involved in the plot, Kano Sugako, Miyasha Tahichi, the guy with the bomb components in his home, and three others. They also took the time to round up 21 other suspected anarchists. Prime Minister Katsura decided that now that he had the excuse, it was time to crack down hard. Koltoku Shusui was one of them. He was arrested at an onsen while recovering from a bout of respiratory illness, because obviously when you're plotting high treason you have to take care of your lungs. Ironically enough, there were a bunch of other anarchist leaders the government wanted to arrest as well, but couldn't. People like the anarchist and labor leader Arahata Kansun. They were in jail as a result of the Red Banner incident back in 1908, and thus, even by the loosely defined standards of evidence which surrounded the whole affair, they couldn't really be said to be involved. Now, the trial of these people were given, well, if you described it as a farce, it would be a grave insult to the farcical arts. The 26 defendants were brought up on charges from Articles 73 to 76 of the Penal Code, which allowed death sentences for those who harmed or attempted to harm the imperial family, and hard labor for those who disrespected the family, which could, for example, include destroying or damaging a Shinto shrine. The chief prosecutor was a man named Hiranuma Kiichiro, who had gotten his start in the Justice Ministry and was generally considered to be a star prosecutor. He was also very much of the tough-on-crime school, and pressed for the death penalty in every case, even those only guilty by association. Incidentally, he's come up in our story before, but later along in his career, as one of the prime ministers of the 1930s. I said we'd be only dealing with him one more time on the show, but it turns out I was wrong. I actually didn't know he was involved with this case until I started writing this episode. He'll come back next August when we turn to the events of 1945, and you probably won't like him much then either. Very recently, in fact only a few years ago, a letter from Kano Sugako to a journalist at the Asahi Shimbun named Sugimura Joel, dated directly before the trial, came to light. It has shed some light on what was going on in her head during the lead-up to the sentencing. The way she wrote it was actually very ingenious. She used a needle to poke characters in a piece of paper, 
so that it looked blank but the writing was visible when you held it up to a light. The letter itself flatly states that Koto Kushusui knew nothing about the plot, and implores Sugimura to find a lawyer for Kotoku. It also correctly predicted the sentencing. The chief judge, Tsurujoichiro, apparently decided that this was no time to look soft on treason, because he went with Hiranuma and sentenced 24 of the 26 defendants to death. The remaining two were given varying terms of imprisonment. Things were getting out of hand. A message had to be sent. This provided an opening for the Imperial House to show its benevolence. The Emperor, who at this point was already ailing and would die of natural causes two years later, personally intervened to commute the death sentences of 13 of the defendants. However, neither Kano nor Kotoku were among them. Kotoku and Kano spent the remaining months in prison. Kotoku's own mother actually died when she came down to Tokyo to visit him and Kano Sugako, whom she was extremely fond of, and then caught pneumonia. Kano, who was quite the writer, left a testament of her reflections during the lead-up to the final carrying out of the execution. It's very moving and deeply depressing. She describes the outcome of the trial, quote, My poor friends, my poor comrades, more than half of them were innocent bystanders who had been implicated by the actions of five or six of us. Just because they were associated with us, they now are to be sacrificed in this monstrous fashion. Simply because they are anarchists, they are to be thrown over the cliffs to their deaths. We had sailed into the vast ocean ahead of the world's current of thought and the general tides of events. Unfortunately, we were shipwrecked, but this sacrifice had to be made to get things started. New routes are opened up only after many shipwrecks and dangerous voyages. This is how the other shore of one's ideals is reached. After the sage of Nazareth, Jesus, that is, was born, many sacrifices had to be made before Christianity became a world religion. In light of this, I feel our sacrifice is minuscule. End quote. The majority of executions, including Kotoku's, were carried out on January 24, 1911. Kano Sugako was executed the next day. Her execution was particularly politically explosive since she was the first woman ever executed by the Meiji government. The story has a sad postscript. After his death, Kotoku Shusui became a martyr to the Japanese left, both because of his intellectual presence before his death and because of his show trial leading up to it. The trials, rather than undercutting the Japanese left, actually galvanized it to a degree. In fact, in 1923, someone tried to avenge him. As then Crown Prince Hirohito was riding to the Diet to open a new session, he passed Toranomon, an area between the Imperial Palace at Akasaka and the Diet Building in Nagatacho. A gunshot rang out. The shot missed the Crown Prince, though it did hit a Chamberlain in the entourage. The perpetrator was tackled shortly after and revealed to be one Nanba Daisuke. Nanba Daisuke was actually the son of a prominent diet man or representative, who had started his life fairly nationalist. He actually considered joining the army, but was converted to radical leftist politics. Among other things, he said that he planned to assassinate Hirohito in revenge for the death of Koto Kushusui. Unsurprisingly, Nanba Daisuke was convicted of high treason in short order and hanged, but now the fear was back. The radical left had not been forced underground by the trials, and now someone had yet again tried to assassinate a member of the imperial family. To make matters worse, the hard left was even more entrenched than it had been before. Like we covered earlier, the Japan Communist Party had been founded a year earlier in 1922, and while the socialists had gone under, the anarchists had not. The communists, if anything, were growing far beyond anything the other two had ever managed. They were even openly getting into academia in the form of Marxist economists like Kawakami Hajime. Clearly, the crackdown initiated by Katsura was not working. He, by the way, had been forced out of office shortly thereafter by a scandal we covered in another episode. Basically, he proved unable to control the army. Something even harsher was necessary. The result was the Peace Preservation Law of 1925, easily the harshest and most authoritarian law in Japanese history, and used to justify the vast majority of the repression that would happen in the 1930s and 1940s. 
The law was written by the Home Minister, who was, wait for it, no one other than our old friend Hiranuma Kiichiro, the prosecutor from the treason trial. The first two articles read, quote, Anyone who organizes a group for the purposes of changing the national polity, or of denying the private property system, or anyone who knowingly participates in said group, shall be sentenced to penal servitude or imprisonment not exceeding ten years. An offense not actually carried out shall also be subject to punishment. Anyone who consults with another person on matters relating to the implementation of these objectives described in Clause 1 of the preceding article shall be sentenced to penal servitude or imprisonment not exceeding seven years. The remainder of the law went on to specify that inciting others to these activities was also punishable by penal servitude, that financially supporting anyone found guilty of these crimes was illegal, and incredibly that you were still guilty even if you broke the law outside of Japanese jurisdiction. A Japanese citizen writing an editorial in the United States about changing the constitution would be arrested upon returning to Japan. When a dietman, questioning the utility of the new law, attempted to undercut Hiranuma by pointing out that the way the law was currently worded, a legislator could be arrested for suggesting an amendment to the Constitution, Hiranuma responded that that dietman was absolutely correct. It says right in the Meiji Constitution that only the Emperor can propose amendments, so anyone else doing so is a violation of the Peace Preservation Law. This draconian bit of lawmaking would become emblematic of totalitarian Japan, and incidentally it would also be one of the first laws repealed under the U.S. occupation government. The peace preservation law really is the ultimate legacy of the Great Treason Incident. The fear with which the Japanese elite looked at the radical left prompted them to put into place a totalitarian system of repression that was then seized by the military and turned on the society it was supposed to defend from radicalism. Kano Sugako and her four compatriots thought they were attacking the linchpin of an oppressive system. In reality, they never really had much of a chance of getting their plan off the ground, and all they did was provide an excuse for a crackdown. Ko Tokushusui and all the other innocent anarchists, meanwhile, became sacrifices in the name of abstract notions of social stability and national security. They were among the first, but they would not be the last. In a final sad note, after the war, the families of the victims tried one last time to get justice. They requested a retrial of the case since, legally speaking, the original verdicts were still on the books. Even after the war, Koto Kushusui was still legally a traitor. Their request for a retrial was denied by the Supreme Court of Japan in 1969. Prior to his execution, Koto Kushusui etched the following onto the wall of his cell. How has it come about that I have committed this grave crime? Today my trial is hidden from outside observers, and I have even less liberty than previously to speak about these events. Perhaps in 100 years someone will speak out about them on my behalf. Well, I guess I'm three years late and I'm not the first to bring this up, but for what it's worth, Kotoku, you were right. That's all for this week. Special thanks this week to Pierre Pru and Jerome Van Epps for donating to support the show. To join them, to find out more about this episode or any other episode, or to submit ideas for future episodes, check out the podcast webpage at www.historyofjapan.wordpress.com or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash historyofjapanpodcast. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week for the life and career of one of Japan's sleaziest politicians, Ozawa Ichiro. <laughs>